afternoon. I'm Anda Kirkov, the director of our entertainment division here at Ream Medium, and on behalf of my entire team, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the Branded Entertainment keynote session. Our speaker today is one of the global leaders in the world of advertising. As the CEO of Ogilvy & Mather Worldwide, Miles Young has a unique insight in some of the most innovative marketing campaigns from around the world. Mr. Young joined Ogilvy & Mather in 1983 and has had over the last 28 years an extraordinary career at the agency. From leading radical changes in the approach of integrated marketing for IBM in the 90s to leading the growth of Ogilvy & Mather in Asia, under his leadership, Ogilvy has won countless awards for creativity and innovation. Mr. Young's truly international career is also demonstrated by his various advisory roles in China, Turkey, and Pakistan, to name just a few. We are very honored to have him with us today, and we will start with a keynote, followed by a Q&A moderated by journalist Kate Bulkley. Please join me in welcoming Miles Young, CEO of Ogilvy & Mather, on stage. Thank you so much, um, and for those lovely introductory remarks, and thank you so much for inviting me here to be with you. We are honored to be here, and in particular to have been the partner of MIPTV, not only for the past five years, but also for this year, in terms of an expanded presence, um, which has resulted in this Brand Entertainment Summit, in the panels, the matchmaking, the screenings, and finally, which will culminate in an award for the content brand of the year. Actually, only a few years ago, um, clients of whom there are a very good representation here today and agencies would have been barely present at this event, if at all. But today, um, the morphing of the businesses of marketing, advertising, entertainment, and all the associated production industries actually, by necessity, bring us face to face. We have no other choice. There's a reordering at work in the world. We all know it. It's a kind of cliche. But the tidy constraints um, which describe the universe of media, marketing, and commerce so neatly have exploded into chaos. So all the ways in which we used to work in the past where brands rented effectively mass audiences and help to subsidize both programming and production are no longer certain as those audiences dissolve from well-regulated planets into masses and millions of fragments. At the same time, consumers, erstwhile somewhat mild-mannered, have become increasingly sophisticated and weary of having messages just pushed at them. They're talking back, sometimes as cruel critics, as cynics, but also as contributors, and mostly, most importantly of all, as conversationists. So in my view, we are witnessing the end of the age of the huckster, where commerce seemed fundamentally force-fitted into the world of content. Remember Wayne's world? Wayne, listen, we need to have a talk about Vanderhoff. The fact is, he's the sponsor. And you signed a contract guaranteeing him certain concessions, one of them being a spot on the show. Well, that's where I see things just a little differently. Contract or no, I will not bow to any sponsor. <laughs> I'm sorry you feel that way, but basically it's the nature of the beast. Maybe I'm wrong on this one, but for me, the beast doesn't include selling out. <laughs> Garth, you know what I'm talking about, right? It's like people only do things because they get paid. And that's just really sad. I can't talk about it anymore. It's giving me a headache. Here, take two of these. Ah, new print. Little, yellow, different. Look, you can stay here in the big leagues and play by the rules, or you can go back to the farm club in Aurora. It's your choice. Yes, and it's the choice of a new generation.
Now, the underpinnings of the chaotic convergence of advertising and content are twofold. First and foremost is the digital revolution. The impact of digital simply cannot be overestimated. It made media truly cross-media. It created a billion-channel universe. It enabled an explosion of expression from blogs and tweets to mixes and mashups. And for us here at MIP TV, it's opened the floodgates on the production and dissemination of video. So YouTube reports that 36 hours of video content is uploaded to the site every minute. If you can do maths quickly, that's a day and a half of viewing every second, or 90 days an hour, or more than a year's worth of video content every two days. Well, we all talk about digital, but while the uh, phenomenon is well understood, maybe the impact for content is often less talked about, partly because we tend to view the new in this industry with unbridled enthusiasm. Ironically, to my mind, it was a sociologist who wrote well before the invention of the internet in the 1970s and 80s who actually diagnosed the effect of the fragmentation of media and the proliferation of information. His name, rather oddly, was Professor Orrin Clapp. But he coined a phrase, and he called it um, the meaning gap. It's such an important phrase. And in his words, he said, as the quantity of information increases, so too does our inability to extract meaning from it. We have moved into an era of cognitive overload, where our brains lose the ability to encode. And that brings me to the second big underpinning of our chaotic context, the latest evolution of branding. In part, in response to the meaning gap, and also due to the fact that brands seem to have lost their way in the digital age, or at least are uncertain about it, a new role for branding is emerging. The good news for brands is that they are coders of information, compressing and expressing logic and emotion in the codes which we more conventionally call brand images. So in a world where meaning is deficient, brands create meaning. And all of our research shows that brands which connect themselves better to cultural trends or truths are stronger anchor points for consumers, and that they are convincing because they have a coherent point of view about the world. They add meaning. Now, we used to be focused as an industry just on finding the big idea. But at Ogilvy, we often talk now about the big ideal. What a difference one small L makes. A brand with a big ideal believes in something. It believes that beauty can be real in the case of Dove, that the world can be smarter in the case of IBM, that a glass half full is better than a glass half empty, as in the case of Coca-Cola. Our research shows that brands with stronger points of view such as these have superior voltage, which is the best predictor of actual market share. So it is the role of brands to bridge the meaning gap, and we can start to see a new order coming out of the chaos. Now, to come to branded entertainment, which was the title of my speech, there have been attempts to describe how branded video fits into this new world. One such attempt was made at Cannes here, in fact, last year, but at the Lions Festival. It tried to relate branded entertainment to the horny old sales funnel. They saw a, a distinction between sponsored content, branded content, and product content, moving down a funnel from impressions to views to engagement to action. I so do not like this model. Does it mean that product videos don't make an impression? Does it mean that sponsors one, sponsored ones don't engage? And by the way, it's all a brand effect, not just the middle bit. But what this suggests to me is that we, in this industry, have a colossal vocabulary problem. Is there a difference between branded entertainment, which I was given as my title, and branded content? If so, what is it? Are they the same as sponsorship? Is product placement branded content or branding content? What is edutainment, by the way? Is viral video branded entertainment? Frankly, until we sort out our terms, it's difficult to see how we can be treated seriously as an industry. 
I've got a very pedantically tidy mind, so here's my starter for 10. I'd rather use the term branded content to describe what we do. I think it much more precisely defines the needs of a contemporary brand's ecosystem. Not all the content that we need is purely entertaining. We need entertainment in all its forms, comedy, drama, and music. But we also need documentary content, which, while it tends to be engaging, is not there primarily to entertain, but often rather to explain. John Bearson, the great pioneer of the documentary film, described it as the creative use of actuality. Branded content draws upon both video as entertainment and video as documentary. Once we've established that, we can start to make sense of the rest and create a kind of taxonomy for branded content. I call it my content cabinet. Look inside and you'll see four boxes. The first box is what I would call leveraged content. That is classically product placement, where the brand, not the product, leverages value from inserting itself in a content property. The next is sponsored, where the role of the brand is to support and gain endorsement from content, including from celebrities. The third is partnered, where the brand collaborates on the development of the property, sharing production, promotion, or distribution. And the fourth box is originated, content that is created solely by the brand. So this content can be either documentary or entertainment, thus making eight boxes in the content cabinet. And we can allocate properties to the compartments of this and turn it into something more akin to a normal chart. So, for instance, the great nightmare documentary which Grierson did, um, which was done for the GPO, actually leveraged the railway company um, in its uh, content. Uh, I Love Lucy, the classic medium for uh, product placement in the 50s and 60s, placed everything from cigarettes um, to cars um, within it and so on. Both of these examples go to show that there ain't nothing new under the sun. But what is new is that the new generation of branded content is being digitally conceived and not just digitally executed. That's because the branded ecosystem demands it. In particular, it demands that any content property has now to be multi-platform, not just operating in one media dimension. It means that rather than just deliver to the audience, it has to be two-way, capable of turning into a dialogue or a conversation, often in real time, and it means it has to be part of a closed loop which links back to some sort of measuring system. How does it translate into preference and purchase? Otherwise, quite frankly, why are we doing it? To me, these three things are what distinguish new branded content from old. This is where brands create their own ecosystems of content to capture and sustain their meaning for customers. The content ecosystem for a brand which we would handle today depends on a critical construct, that of owned channels, social channels and external channels, all organized around a big ideal. And here is one such typical content system. Own channels, social channels, and external channels. This is what we are producing content to live in. And it's in this ecosystem that we have to provide the furnishing. It's important to understand that it's not a random thing anymore. It is or should be meticulously and carefully designed. What we produce here in this room must follow the needs of the ecosystem, not vice versa. There's something else also, and that has to do with the relationship between story and strategy. Storytelling and strategy delivery. In the old days, advertisers used to hitch onto someone else's story, which may have had little or no connection with the brand's belief system. Today, as we do more and more partnered and originated content towards the right-hand side of the chart, we have more of a need to give the brand a natural role within the story. But at the same time, there are greater risks, chances of missing the mark or amplifying an affiliation or attribute that is off strategy and contrary to the brand's belief system. So we, the television industry, the branding industry, come together in this shared space, and it's incumbent for content producers to understand the degree of refinement which has become intrinsic to global best practice in branding. 
Brand marketeers know the drivers of impact and persuasion, and they know them through the filter of the brand persona. And anyone who lives through the amount of testing, which just 30 seconds of advertising tends to be submitted to routinely before it airs, will know exactly what I mean. Equally, it's essential for those of us who do branding to listen and understand how narrative can engage and enthrall those who are primarily um, storytellers. If we do this right, we have a chance to find the perfect intersection, the best balance between the power of the story and the discipline of strategy. Now, to illustrate how this new world works, I want to show some recent examples, and they're all very recent. The first is how IBM leveraged the game show Jeopardy to ensure its Watson um, computer was not only a contestant, but a contestant which um, won. Why would IBM consider doing this? Why would the world's most respected technology company want to compete in Jeopardy? Well, actually, Watson involved assembling a vast database of knowledge from ranges of domains of human experience, and then applied deep analytics and complex systems theories in, in very radically new ways. It became, if you like, a living avatar of our smarter planet belief system around which IBM's image has been restored and rebuilt. And the team at Ogilvy was engaged in creating this avatar's personality, um, bringing it to life with human-like qualities. And if you haven't seen it, this is what people saw. Hello, my name is Watson. everything from robots to cartoons. We ended up building the avatar to look like it came from the series of Smarter Planet icons. It had to almost evoke what a contestant might go through. Would it be happy? Would it be sad? We wanted to document Watson's process because it would be fascinating for people to understand what went into building Watson. Who is Richard Nixon? <laughs> no, that's not right. Excuse me, I didn't agree to this footage. It makes me look foolish. What about my success? Watson. Who is Franz Liszt? You are right. I was in TV commercials, newspaper ads. They made films about my brain and how I can benefit society. Look at my Twitter following. People like me. I became news. I'm bigger than Elvis. I was watching uh, Jeopardy last night. It was the number two most watched show on all of television. Watson. 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 Mama. Life has just begun. So this is product placement on steroids. This is new age content. This is multi-platform. And traffic to IBM's website went up by 556% as a result of the Jeopardy run. Research amongst US viewers showed that over 70% recognized Watson by name. They knew that IBM was responsible for Watson. They had a more positive view of IBM as a result. And it's a perfect balance between story and strategy and a perfect link into IBM's Smarter Planet digital ecosystem. Another example from the cabinet would be sponsored entertainment. China is exploding in this uh, area, and perhaps one of the very best cases is the work that we have done for um, China Mobile, and by some measures, the world's largest brand. Our client uh, there has got a youth product called M-Zone, and uh, M-Zone has had an eight-year relationship with J. Jo, um, who is a musician, a singer-songwriter, a film producer, an actor, and a director. This is him, if you don't know him. So over time, he's become an icon for China Mobile and pervasive in everything that they do. And he himself has become not just the medium for the campaign, but also to some degree the creator of the campaign, um, writing original music, um, creating uh, university and uh, in-campus events. 
um, an, an M Zone album, and so on, um, and of course, starring in the TV commercials. But this content is also multi platform, it's also highly con conversational, and it has helped create um, the M Zone generation, as they're called in China, a, uh, a generation of funky netizens uh, who participate in this digitally uh, enabled uh, and uh, exciting zone that uh, Jay has created for them. And here's an example of a sponsored documentary uh, for DuPont. Um, our client DuPont has recently struck a deal with the BBC um, World News to sponsor Horizons, which will be a new series about businesses rising in this coming decade, um, those companies and leaders who are also focusing on some of the world's most pressing problems. And Ogilvy Entertainment approached the BBC about creating a series that DuPont would sponsor within this to complement their strategy um, of research and product development in developing areas. And this series, which will be broadcast um, around the BBC World News, takes a look at um, the companies that are likely to have the biggest impact on the way mankind will live and work uh, in the future. And it not just, doesn't just take the form of documentaries, but also of mini documentaries uh, as well. And here's a clip from um, what is actually a pre, uh, very much a work in progress title, but also from one of the films which um, talks about um, the creation of bullet uh, resistant uh, vests and, and protective surfaces uh, in, in Brazil. So this is really a preview because um, this footage was being shot um, just uh, 10 days ago, and thanks to the BBC and DuPont for allowing me to show it. Foi o primeiro dia dele de trabalho depois das férias, quando eles entraram numa rua eles já depararam com um bom andamento. Foi onde começou o confronto e deu, deu início à troca de tiro. Ele foi alvejado. Eu fiquei imaginando eu reiniciar uma vida sozinha, com três filhos para criar e sem ele do meu lado. Há quatro anos atrás, um colete à prova de bala chegava a custar mil dólares. Nós conseguimos, unindo a produção local, tecnologia, reduzir o preço do colete em até 70%. Eu tenho muita pouca perda de policiais em serviço com uso de colete. E voltei, pensei, eu, tirei, eu, tinha, eu falei, não posso morrer, eu tenho três filhos, eu tenho minha mulher, sabe, eles dependem de mim, eles precisam de mim. Se ele tivesse sem o colete, eu, hoje eu estaria vivo. So very engaging documentary content. Its purpose, though, is to inform. It will be aired on May the 6th, first, around the world news. And next, I want to come home to France, where we are, to talk about a case for Europe Car, another client of ours, who wanted to generate uh, more interest in their um, Auto Liberté uh, rental program, which was designed for city dwellers as an alternative to all the stress and strain of car ownership. And uh, you'll remember Candid Camera, some of you, but uh, this uh, idea um, takes um, a video look at a series of, of victims, um, and you'll see the story when I show you the clip. Um, they were carefully chosen, so none of them will be disabled by the experience, and you'll understand why. <laughs> Let's look at Europa Car, originated entertainment. Oh, 
autorité réglementaire pour l'équilibre automobile. J'écoute. Oui, c'est quoi ça J'ai un avis de compression de ma voiture. Oui, vous étiez garé où, dites-moi Mais j'étais garé sur le parking Val de Rap, là. C'est quoi cette histoire Et Votre véhicule rentrait dans le plan de réduction du parc automobile. Mais pourquoi Mais on m'avait prévenu Il y a un sac à l'intérieur. Je le récupère comment Il est où, mon sac Mais franchement, votre voiture, vous n'avez pas vraiment besoin. Surtout une voiture rouge, c'est tellement années 80. Ah bah, Rentrer en bus ou on va vous trouver Mais quelque chose. Mais je veux pas rentrer en bus, putain ah, de là, merde. Là, vous pouvez pas monter là-dessus. Hein. Hey Non, Bravo. bien joué Franchement, bien joué Parce que putain, comment je me suis fait prendre sur ce goût C'est génial Vraiment, bravo, génial Parce que putain, quand on voit ça, on se dit vraiment, on est chez les malades mentaux So, thankfully, not one of those real people uh, carried a grudge or had a heart attack. Um, but uh, the result of what was a, a cross-media effort, the radio station was involved, of course, was amazing. And that video, in fact, there were six, I think, um, similar to that, received two and a half million views just in, 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 in one week. Um, uh, so, uh, website traffic um, increased by about 300%. Um, and the subscriptions to Auto Liberté increased by 83%. Uh, this is the power of content and a great intersection of story and strategy. And the next examples I want to show are for UPS. First of all, some um, sponsored um, documentary content. We won the UPS account about 18 months ago, and the basis on which we won it was to help them shift from being a transactional package distribution company in perceptual terms, which they were not in real terms, uh, into owning the high ground of logistics, a major platform shift. Um, logistics being something that makes the world go round, um, that helps business achieve its objectives. And branded content has been a very, very important uh, plank of what has been uh, a successful um, repositioning. Um, firstly, uh, uh, in terms of sponsorship, and one example of this is some fantastic sponsorship which we did with National Geographic, um, creating an original series called Great Migrations. Every fall, the red crabs of Christmas Island undertake a great migration made possible by great logistics. They have limited time to ensure the survival of their species. Departures are synchronized, contingency planning overcomes obstacles, and just in time, they deliver their eggs. In their world, just like ours, on-time arrivals depend on logistics. UPS is a proud sponsor of Great Migrations on the National Geographic Channel. So, so actually, there are some very innovative camera techniques uh, and, and production techniques there. But what we're doing, of course, is to give some new meaning to the word logistics by aligning it with the natural and instinctual uh, movements of various um, species. So again, story and strategy um, perfectly aligned. But also for UPS, uh, we have originated content, particularly documentary content. Um, if you go into the uh, digital ecosystem of UPS, you'll find it populated with this sort of content. Here's just one example from Mexico, um, where we um, look at a company that makes um, the little plaster models um, which are sold around the Mexican Day of the Dead. Our company is in Cuernavaca. Al estar cerca de México, la logística es mucho más fácil, es todo centralizado, es más fácil conseguir clientes y materia prima. Contratábamos compañías de logística para mandarlos a diferentes localidades. Desde Laredo a veces mandalo a Nueva York, o Houston, a Los Ángeles. Pero nos encontramos que pues está enfocado UPS, está en lo que nosotros necesitábamos y nos olvidábamos absolutamente de, de toda la logística. Este producto y le hemos permitido a empresas como Grupo Rev e incrementar su número de clientes, incrementar su facturación, ser más exitosos ellos y ser más exitosos nosotros. El cliente lo ha notado que, que la calidad. So this sort of content is again documentary content. It's probably a little bit closer to um, advertorial, but it is fundamental to what we have to furnish that content ecosystem with masses and masses of useful video content which is accessed, used, and then which links back to some measure of uh, demand generation and ultimately leads. Another example is investment. Classified ads that made 30 to 40 dollars profit in a week and I placed those ads in around a thousand other newspapers around the country. That's how I generated over $50,000 a week 
out of my one bedroom apartment and in my making money package I'll show you some secrets about placing ads that's gonna make you wish you started doing this five years ago that's what we hate <laughs> and this is what we did for TD Ameritrade What would you say are your main areas of concern when it comes to your finances? I am concerned about the fact that I'm spending my entire checks month to month. Oh my god, it's $94. It's 54 bucks. Oh my god, it's <laughs> What we're spending. If you don't understand what's going on with your financial life, then you really don't understand your life. Boys, explain stocks in a very visual and uh, tasty way. Each of these cars is a company. Okay. A stock is a slice of that company. We're slowly building a portfolio. So, I have purchased some of that company. Yes. But I'm not diversified now. No, you're not. When you diversify your portfolio, your money's spread out all over the place. In other words, you haven't put all your eggs in one basket. I think it is a great thing that I'm starting to be educated about my portfolio. So, like, I'm looking at it and I'm realizing that all the information exists. It's not like it's just floating up there and I can't put my hands on it. Welcome to The Invested Life. Visit theinvestedlife.msn.com to get started. So the first clip evokes very well the whole tone and world of the huckster. But what we were trying to do here was to, through content, tell stories of real people's experiences in managing their money, showing them with investment advisors and documenting their journeys um, through the world of investment. So it's reality series, um, uh, but it's content which um, t teamed up with m and Money and Generate was distributed um, uh, in the form of some 300 uh, individual short videos um, following some 14 archetypal um, investors and their problems and solutions. Um, again, it's New World. It created a lift in brand equity. It um, scored uh, uh, big in, in, in public relations. Um, uh, and it helped to stigmatize, if you like, the world of greedy bonus mongers and, and uh, traditional um, uh, investment uh, hawkers. Um, TD Ameritrade has become the good guy helping people to become better investors. And finally, and for something completely different, an originated documentary for IBM um, that we've just made. This year is IBM's centennial. And to mark this, um, we work to research and list the 100 most iconic projects which the company had participated in during its history, one for each year. And from those, we selected eight of them and commissioned um, Errol Morris um, and also Philip Glass to do the music um, to tell us those stories. So this went onto the website. Um, uh, it quickly went viral, um, reposted on blogs, um, a huge U YouTube hit. Um, and uh, that's all for a 30-minute um, documentary. But I've got here the 90-second trailer to show you. Tom Watson Sr. used to go into the lab at Endicott when that was the only lab they had, and he would corner some young engineer and he'd say, what do we sell? The young man would say, punch card machine, sir. No, no. We sell a service that satisfies. 60 years ago, IBM was using technology in the defense area, and could that be applied to solve this problem that the airlines had of making reliable reservations? National Geographic came to us and proposed the idea to reconstruct the entire human family tree. When Kennedy announced we're gonna to go to the moon, that was a thrilling proposition to me. We were selected to go work on a top secret project. The grocery industry decided to put scanners in grocery stores. The task was fairly daunting. I discovered this amazing world. It was there, absolutely waiting. I was convinced that computers would really change the world. If you have time for a story, I'll tell you why. Quite beautiful, isn't it? And again, um, a perfect balance between story and strategy and a perfect contribution to the Smarter Planet 
uh, content ecosystem which we have constructed. So all the cases that I've shown this evening represent in some form or other this new world of branded content. And it's no coincidence that they tend to be originated or partnered, the last two boxes in my neat little cabinet. Because that's the territory of the future, I believe. None of them were conceived of in isolation. They were all seen as part of some strategic purpose. Whether they are entertaining primarily or useful primarily, they are all purpose-driven. They all aim to allow the brand to converse with the audience and vice versa. They all fulfill a strategic agenda, agenda in the digital age. They help bridge the meaning gap and project the brand's ideal. And they all reflect the movement from the world of singular messages to the world of mutually reinforced, multi-dimensional content. They are all far beyond brought to you by. Some commentators have sought to simplify the convergence of our industries as a headline about Hollywood and Madison Avenue. I hope I've shown that the opportunity is much bigger and much more complex. The cabinet of content which is open to us spans many diverse types and models. As creative agencies and as digital strategists, we the agencies have a new role much more akin to that of a publisher. We bring consumer understanding and information architecture to the party. As producers, you bring the art and craft of storytelling and an understanding of the economics and logistics of making the content successful. But in doing all of this, let's remember that it's all about the nature and quality of that content. And in the words of our founder, David Ogilvy, who also celebrates a centennial this year, which we will mark in June, what really decides consumers to buy or not is the content of your advertising, not your form, not its form. Thank you very much indeed. Great. Thank you, Miles. That was fantastic. Let's, let's go over here and we'll have a chat. I'm not quite sure why that's there. Do you have a, you have a mic on, don't you? I have a mic on. So we don't need that, do we? No, I don't think we do. You've got one as I've well. got a mic yes. on, so we're okay. Hello, I'm Kate Bulkley. Very interesting, Miles. I think what we've seen um, from that is, you know, a lot of really beautiful content. I think that, you know, you've dispelled the myth that uh, everything that advertising agencies are involved in is just sell, sell, sell. Some of that was really beautiful content. Um, although I'm not sure how I would have reacted if my car had been compressed. I'm not, I think I might have had a heart attack. <laughs> I thought that guy actually was very well behaved. Let me, I'm going to ask a couple of questions, then we're going to open it up to you guys. Um, let me start here. I mean, this industry has gone through quite a bad recession. Um, you know, we've seen advertising money go out of the system. Where do you think the money is for original digital content? I mean, is it coming back? Is it coming back in the same way that it was before we had this recession, or did it never go away? And where are you seeing it come? Is it in more of the documentary stuff, or in more of the entertainment stuff? So is it coming back? Is it coming back the same, and where? Well, I think when the recession, recession hit, it all went away. It all um, went away, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and nothing was really immune. Um, digital was not immune from the recession. No. So what we're seeing right now is a situation where, more or less, we're back to 2008 levels as, as an industry. I would say by mid-year we, 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 we should be. Um, within that picture of recovery, there's no doubt in my mind that um, branded content is taking a larger share of the pie. A larger and share. I, yeah, and I, I think the reason is precisely because more and more brands are realizing that they have to have content um, in the digital world, yep. but, that, but they, that they are now starting to plan how to do it. So this horrible phrase, content ecosystem, is, is, is really very, very important because it means it's part of a strategy. And as soon as you've got a strategy with nice, neat... Um, um, planets and, and circles and squares on it, you've got to start filling those. And so there is a kind of thirst for this sort of content. I certainly think the thirst is more in the documentary area, um, or, or it's sort of faster yeah. than, than it, uh, in, in that area than it is in the pure entertainment area at the moment, which is why I slightly bias my examples in, in that zone, and why I don't like the term branded entertainment, yeah. because I think it's much broader than just entertainment. Yeah, yeah. When, you, when you look at... Um, how the, uh, let's say, the creative agency world fits in with the TV world. What do you think they each bring? You said that it's about collaboration. You said it's about partnership going forward. What does each side bring? Well, I, I think in the worst of all possible worlds, you can have um, 
entertainment which is produced by the entertainment world, which is wildly off strategy. And you can have content which is produced by the advertising world, which is utterly boring. Hmm. And <laughs> the, the task and uh, the importance of meetings like this is to, is to bring these two parties together. And so it is, you know, I think there's a fear in, in the, in the amongst producers that somehow strategy is dangerous and, 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 and to be avoided at all costs. It's necessary, I've tried to show that. Um, it doesn't have to be boring. And that, that's the mm. contribution that yeah. we can make together. Yeah. Do you think that the guys who make the 30-second spots, which has basically been your business for a long time, now you're moving into this, but do they have the, the same skills or the skills that we need to make more long-form content? I mean, this industry, the television industry, is about making long-form content, returning series, things that go on, you know, soaps. Are the skills... You know. No, I, th I think they're different skills, mm. um, very different skills. And, uh, you know, we've seen the arrival of long-form messaging as, yeah. as something else. It's not necessarily branded content, I think. But um, creative people have started to learn to work outside the constraints of a 30-second spot. Uh, the techniques are very different. Uh, the, 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 the techniques of a 30-second spot are all about compression, la grande compression. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, l learning uh, how to paint in a, in a much more extended um, canvas is, is something that can be quite painful. And, and in, in some cases, we, we, we wouldn't ask people to do that actually either. So I think what we're talking about is, is a, a new world where clients and agencies work together much more collaborative, collaboratively with a range of content producers. Okay. The other thing I think this industry is always interested about, or, or let's say finds a bit um, bemusing, is who to go to in your world. You know, there's the creative agency, which is what Ogilvy Mather is. Yeah. Then there's the, um, the, the sort of the media buying agency, which may, yeah. might be a Group M or something to use, something in your company. Where is this happening? Where is the content creation happening? Who, create, who owns the budgets? You know, who should these people be talking to? Well, I, I think it's horses for courses. And, and, and uh, um, if, if you want a slightly media-led um, view of content, then you would probably find it quite helpful to go to a media agency. Uh, we come at it from a creative point of view, but not just a creative point of view, also from a digital point of view. Okay. So I think it's important to understand that our role has evolved as a, as a, as a very large digital agency. We have 4,000 digital specialists around the world into designing the content systems mm. in which the content lives. Mm. And the content is, is richer the more it is integrated into the system. The system is better the more it comes out of the content. So there's, there's that role as well, which is rather different from the old mass media role. Okay. So if they want to be digital, probably go creative. Yeah. yeah but yeah. it is horses, of course, depending yes. on yeah. what the brand is and what yes. they're trying yeah. to do, I yeah. suppose. Yeah. Yes. So there's still some conflict, it sounds there are like. Plenty of choice. There are plenty of choices. There's no one way of doing this right. at, at all, Kate. Right. Um, let's open it up to you guys, because I see I've got a lot, a lot of time on the clock. So does anyone have a question for Miles um, now? Could we bring the lights up so I can actually see? Somebody have a question for... Uh, no. Yes? Yes, sorry. Go ahead. Yes, sorry, I couldn't see you. Could you get the mic to that lady there? Is there another question I can queue up while we're getting that right there? So we're going to get the second mic to this fellow. Yep, sheet note. So she's going first. OK, the girl up there. Okay. See, the girl with the microphone up there, wave your arm. Yeah, wave your arm. There you go. All right, tell us who you are. Thank you. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm a documentary filmmaker formerly, and I'm, I've just currently set up a TV station, and I'm looking at... Um, Put the at mic near your mouth. Please. Sorry, and I'm yep. currently looking at issues around sort of branded and sponsored content. And uh, one issue, obviously, which I find worrying, and I'm sure it's not the first time that this issue has been raised, is, um, you know, we're going to have our, our sort of raison d'etre is to have objective information as far as it can be objective, and very balanced journalism and very good factual programming, which is also very balanced. And in our marketplace, that's particularly important. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's important everywhere, but there's a dearth of it in our particular market. And um, I think that what worries me about this angle on branded entertainment is, um, you know, can you have, let's say it's not IBM, let's say it's a less squeaky clean, if it is indeed squeaky clean, a company, and you make a documentary about it, and it's, and it's all wonderful, and it's singing and dancing, on the one hand, and in, uh, does that mean that in your news you can't say that this company has done something wrong? And in what way does this actually tie the hands of your factual programmers and your, and your news <coughs> reporters? I mean, I think it's actually, as a television station, quite a worrying okay. um, uh, 
concern. Okay, so yeah. your concern about you know the sort of the creep of the advertising message yeah. into the into the editorial integrity of the program, yeah? Or of, the, of, of a channel, channel, let's say. Of I mean, the where does it? Okay. Wh wh how yeah. does the channel stand? You know, when it's great. Thank you very much. Up? Men, I, I'm not sure that you know this is any different from what we've lived with for years, mm -hmm. which is the role of advertising within um, channels. Um, actually, so it, it honestly doesn't worry me. But I think the, 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 the deeper answer is that the content itself in today's world can't be anything other than honest and authentic. In the world of social media, it has to be true. It can't deceive, it can't lie, it, it can't uh, mislead. Um, because if it does, you'll be dead within yeah. 24 hours. You'll hear about it on yeah. Facebook, that's for sure. Uh, there was another guy who had a mic here who had it. Yes, go yeah. ahead. What's your name? M my name is Miriam F. I'm a producer and I produce TV content. I have a question uh, con in connection with the uh, content cabinet. How do you see the, the branded content into the scripted formats? The entry of the branded content into the longer formats, like movies and miniseries. Right, so Thank from you. the shorter form to the longer form. How do you see that from the brand get branding money or branded content into longer form pieces. Yeah, I think it, 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 no, there's a cost issue <laughs> here. Uh, and most of the examples I showed are long form by our definition, but they're still relatively short. So at the end of the day, we, we, we have to be realistic. Um, a brand has a budget, um, the budget has to pay back, and large capital costs are difficult to justify. Um, now, uh, 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 there will always be blockbuster ideas which make it worthwhile. Um, but we have to be careful because I think they're extraordinary rather than the norm. Mm, mm, good, good answer. All right, now I've, the clock says zero, so I don't think I'm going to take any more. So could you please join me in thanking Miles Young, CEO of Ogilvy & Mabel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.